It's another Monday and therefore another happy dose of the Creative Boom podcast with your host, Katie Cowan. For episode 43, my guest is Eric Brandt, a graphic designer and educator who's been active since the mid 90s. He's currently chair of the design department and professor of graphic design at Minneapolis College of Art and Design in Minnesota. A member of the Alliance Graphique Internationale, you'll certainly be familiar with his work. From 2013 to 2018, he created Fictioni Typographica, a project dedicated to typographic exploration in a public space. In this case, at his home garage in Powderhorn, an epic project that has since been celebrated in a book of the same name. Eric began his career as a cartoonist in Japan in 1994, where he discovered a love for graphic design. Since then, his focus has been in print media. And with his own design studio, Typographica, his work has been published and exhibited internationally, and he has also received acclaim for his very, very silly short films. In this episode, we talk about the twists and turns of Eric's interesting career so far. We hear more about those days he spent in Japan, his experience as an amateur cyclist, and various proud projects along the way. We chat about the joy of teaching graphic design, how the next generation of creatives are different from any generation he's met before, and why he's hopeful for the future. As always, I don't tend to focus too much on the work. You know me, I do love to find out about the person behind the brand, so there are plenty of giggles and warm stories along the way. Season two has been made completely possible thanks to our sponsor, Shillington, the original graphic design bootcamp that helps students achieve award-winning portfolios and land incredible jobs in as little as three months. We'll be meeting one of Shillington's teachers later in the show to get some excellent career tips for you. But for now, here's my chat with Eric. Well, it's so lovely to see you, Eric. Um, I've been really looking forward to this because obviously I've got so many questions to ask you, so many burning questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's such an honor. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, where where are you currently um, based? That that huge room that you have behind you looks like an awesome space. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm I'm here in in Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, mm-hmm. in South Minneapolis, in a neighborhood called Powderhorn. And this is my um, my basement studio. It's, it's <laughs> a thing of beautiful. It's beauty. <laughs> wow, thank you very much. I know I really enjoy being down here. Yeah, it's like your kind of man cave, but it literally is a, a <laughs> cave, isn't it? <laughs> it, it? It literally is. It's it's below, below ground. And um, yeah, it's quite well insulated, actually, because it gets really cold here. But um, I blew in this. Uh, uh, it's actually made from recycled plastic bottles. So even in the worst of winter, it's not that bad. Oh, that's very cool. That's that's beautiful. And I can see your artworks in the background there. They're just beautiful graphic art, art compositions. I mean, you've, you've proudly got them on display. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, these are all in progress. And that's how I've been um, spending a lot of COVID time, like a lot of people just with things that I have on hand and trying to make trying to make things. Yeah, definitely. I think I'm. I've been the same. I've I've been sort of doing a few creative things, and obviously pouring my heart into Creative Boom and writing about artists and designers, which is my passion. But I've been doing really random things like making smudges out of herbs. And during the you know last summer, have you heard oh, of smudges? They're yes, kind of, of course. Yeah. Yeah, very very hippie. I love that kind of stuff. And um, <laughs> planting herbs for the first time and growing those and being so kind of like almost tearful when I saw the little buds and shoots coming through that I made this plant, you know. Oh, this, what I was en- wrong with us last year? We were all an emotional mess. Oh, that's so wonderful. I I envy you. We're we're far away from planting season. I was still shoveling snow yesterday morning, so <laughs> Oh well we're not quite there yet, but we have we have had a heat wave here, but you know, uh, we, a brief bit of snow, but not like the kind of snow you must get there. Gosh. <laughs> well, it's it's all good. It's very normal. We're having a very mild winter by comparison, so we can't complain. No. So I was uh, looking at your CV and it's very unique and beautiful and shows a, a life. Oh. And I can't reveal too much of your age here, Eric, but you know, it, shows, <laughs> it shows a long list of uh, achievements. But it starts with, um, and I think this reveals so much about your character, Eric, um, born on a snowy morning in Missoula, Montana. That's just poetic. 
Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> it's well, it's just it's just true. Um, yeah, no, that was uh, that was some time ago now. Um, but yeah, I was I was I was born there in Missoula, and um, yeah, it's, it's still have you know natural affinity for for mountains and and snow, obviously. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, being out in nature and you, you didn't really sort of stay there. Well, you, you stayed in America for a while, but you moved to Germany when you were eight years old. Is that right? Yeah, actually I was seven. Um, and yeah, before that, I mean, we were living in, um, in Malawi and Cameroon in Africa. And, uh, yeah, we, we got to Germany, um, when I was seven and I was, thoroughly confused. I could barely speak English. My first language was French and they threw me into German school. So oh my goodness. I still suffer um, uh, from, you know, lack of proper grammar skills and syllable identification, which my daughter was just torturing me with the other day. I was <laughs> trying to help her with her remote school and I'm just absolutely the worst at that stuff. <laughs> yeah. So how many languages do you speak? Well, j now just English and German. Right. So you've forgotten the French. And... I for I've forgotten. I can still I can still uh, understand quite a bit. I did study Spanish later in life, and a little bit of Arabic, and also a little bit of Japanese. So I'm conversational to some degree, more more, more childlike, I would say. Yeah. And do you, would you say that kind of translates in a lot of your work? Oh, absolutely. Um, my it's 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 the core of it i mean i didn't discover that until very late in life but the, my um love and interest for language and language um structures i could say given my obvious weaknesses that i just mentioned <laughs> was really the the foundation of um of my road to graphic design which sort of meandered i i studied philosophy as an undergraduate student mm. um but that 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 interest in language and logic structures it was was there as well, and so I was very happy later in life in Japan actually to to discover graphic design and and um, and see that you could play with all of these toys. And I mean, I'd always been drawing and 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 um, and making um, bad art, um, Come but on. yeah, that was that was the beginning of it all. So you moved to Japan in ninety three. Yes. And you were a cartoonist and you're the editor of Radar magazine and you're doing a little bit of, you know, starting to sort of go into that world. Um, and I suppose being in Japan, wow, that's just an amazing place to be if you love typography and, and visual communication. It's just a sort of kaleidoscope of wonderful, oh. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and you've, you've, you've visited there too, I know. And it, yeah, it's, it's graphic design heaven. Um, oh, it's amazing. Both, both in a historical sense and a contemporary sense. And so, yeah, no, I was really fortunate. It was a matter of, of being in the right place at the right time. I was living in, um, Kyushu in, in Fukuoka. Um, and like most, um, foreigners when you when you first arrive in japan you're teaching english mm -hmm. and um i had the good luck to um to to be in fukuoka when they were starting a um, an english language magazine and so i i kind of i went over there very curious and showed them this comic that i've been making for friends and they actually you know to my great surprise wanted to publish it um and then they discovered that I could, uh, um, you know, edit. And so I just worked my way in and then I convinced them to hire me full time. And, um, I started learning, uh, Quark Express in Japanese characters and oh my goodness. sort of, sort of just memorizing, um, memorizing patterns, you know, where I could do this and do that. And then, um, yeah, no, it was it was great. I was surrounded by these brilliant Japanese designers and um, and reporters, and this incredible work culture that they have there. Um, so it was it was nonstop for about two years, um, and I learned a lot. But I I was yeah I was such a I I really had no idea what I was doing at all. So do any of us know what we're doing half the time? <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, and I suppose that was the fun of it too. I mean, it, yeah. you know, we we got to do a lot of. I mean, um, I think back on it now, and it, I mean, I got to, I got to interview, you know, Radiohead when they were, 
it's actually in their movie. You know that film they made, uh, Meeting People is Easy? They have scenes from their time in Fukuoka. Yes. And I'm not in any of them, to my regret, but oh. I, I did get to interview those guys. They were very sweet. And I I, a, Do you know what? <laughs> I've interviewed them as well. Well, I you interviewed. Have? <laughs> yeah, isn't that something else we share in common? Oh, that's um, amazing. The bass guitarist. Um, and and they're incredibly sweet. I was working, yeah. I was working for a secondhand uh, music shop where it was their job to source old analog vintage keyboards for um, the music industry, and a lot of their clients happened to be bands. So it would be people uh, like brilliant. Radiohead yeah. and Oasis. I remember oh. the, the the drummer from Oasis pulling up in this small town where I grew up in his, it was this, sorry if he's listening, this hideous, <laughs> massive um, uh, Bentley in, I think it was brown. <laughs> And he just walked out and it was this character that, you know, we'd grown up with and in, in, in our teenage years and he, he'd just come to pick up a drum machine. You know, it was quite quite <laughs> surreal in this tiny backwater town in the depths of, you know, the northwest of England. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I somehow managed to blag being the kind of, you know, adventurous spirit that I am, uh, an interview with the, the bass guitarist and my boss didn't mind. So that was nice. Oh, that's so brilliant. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, no, it's similar. Well, it, I got the call really late to run over there. Um, for, for, I think they were playing two shows and it was the first show. And I spoke mostly with um, Ed O'Brien, right? The guitarist. And, yes. and I was completely unprepared. And I think he really enjoyed that because I didn't ask them anything about their music. I just asked them about like how they were enjoying, uh, you know, food and had they been to this little place and this little place. So it actually turned out to be a really great conversation. Um, I, I hoped, I mean, I was, I was kind of terrified, but they, <laughs> they played a, just an absolutely brilliant show there. It was fantastic. Well, you just remembered the the classic golden rule there that, you know, people just like people and you, yeah. could, you could have gone in and asked questions about their next album or it's just so <laughs> contrived, isn't it? And, yeah. Well, that's right. They were right. That was right before they released OK Computer. Oh, wow. And they were playing, they were playing mostly songs from the bands and they had, they were playing a few songs that were on OK Computer, but that was, yeah, it was, it was, there, there were, Fukuoka, the, the place where they played was this really small venue, but we, we did get some uh, big bands there. Um, the, the, the one other great show that I saw there was the Beastie Boys when they, I think it was Ill Communication. Oh. And I, th I thought, oh, they're going to be, because they were really massive at that point. I thought, oh, they're going to be so depressed. There's only about 200 people here or something like that. But it was like, this is this is one of my silly moments in life where, you know, I'm I'm quite tall, especially in, in Japan. I'm, you know, 6'5". So yeah, I was that is tall for Japan. Liter literally the only gaijin there. And uh, I was sitting in the middle and we were all having just a fantastic time because they were just, they were amazing. And then at one point in between songs, I think it was, um, it was MCA. He was like, and I was just drenched in sweat and we'd been jumping up and down and screaming and stuff like that. And he goes, like, MCA was like, yo, look at that guy. And then, um, Adam Yauk was like, yeah, it's like he's got his own private island. <laughs> and I was like, yes. You know, oh, that's these right. moments. We just cherish them, don't we? All these kind of, I yeah. remember my first gig was when I was barely turned 16. And um, it was with a band called Pop Will Eat Itself. Um, mm. and I loved them mainly because of their album yeah. covers. So I didn't, yeah. I didn't realize back then it was, you know, graphic design and illustration. Same. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just didn't realize. And I went and I'd made a pink t-shirt and in one of the albums, um, they'd provided, um, I can't remember what the album was called, but it provided a stencil, um, and it said absolutely, am I allowed to swear? F fooked. As they say, as they say a nicer version of the word. The Irish and, pronunciation. Yes, exactly. Um, and I just, you know, filled it in with a kind of black felt tip pen and then put it on this old, uh, I, I used to buy sort of children's clothes because it was a cheap way of getting, you know, colourful T-shirts in different bright oh, colours. so cool. And I, I wore that with absolutely fucked 
on it and then a you know little white denim um and I looked I probably looked about 12 you know ridiculous and I just remember being right at the front and getting this massive bruise across my you know just above my stomach from being shoved up against the barrier but I was just I was in heaven and then afterwards being a little groupie around the back and banging on the window of the uh the Hanley in Stoke-on-Trent and the the venue going and shouting their names which I can't remember now and I I ended up in the um, enemy they they said the the young girl oh, with the wow. pink t-shirt um, was banging on the window, de- you know, determined to get their autograph. And that's just incredibly great. I love that story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just have so many more over the years, but I'm sure you're the same. I think no, we, I don't the, think. <laughs> the music and the you know these lovely little encounters as a, as a journalist mm. you get to have with these people with these interesting characters that have made a career out of doing something quite you know left field really. Yeah, no, you're so right. It's so true. Mm. Japan is a nice place to be if you're a bit left field and quirky, because um, (laughs) as I discovered when I went with my future sister-in-law, Tora, who had at the time bright white hair, and she's covered in these stunning, (laughs) beautiful tattoos. And we just got followed around like celebrities. We didn't know what was going on. And we had all these older men taking pictures of us with these massive lens um, yeah. cameras we just had no idea and it Skibbit. wasn't is, what's that <laughs> Skibbe is the is a it's a uh, um, how, what do you say it's an expression for uh, someone who's leering or you know sort oh of is a, that what they were doing yeah oh. maybe because <laughs> we came out of the temple um, at uh, Asakusa and um, there's suddenly about 10 of them all with the cameras and they were all sort of <laughs> gesturing to us going come on <laughs> Come on. So we just kind of stood awkwardly together and I put my arm around her and she put her arm around me and we just sort of grinned. And then they all just started flashing the cameras. <laughs> and then they and then they dispersed and we walked off and I said to Tora, I said, what was that all about? She, I don't know. <laughs> we just went and got some sushi somewhere. Oh, brilliant. Oh, it's so, it's such a wonderful thing. I feel so honoured to have gone twice, um, but to have lived there. Wow. That's yeah. a different experience. No, it's 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 such a, a a great memory. I loved every minute of living there. And you you mentioned the food. I mean, it's the best food in the world, I think. And they, mm. I, they yeah, Japan really saved me because I was such a picky eater. Um, <laughs> and then I got to really expand my palate when I was there. And um, yeah, no, I I I know a lot of a lot of foreigners had had trouble adjusting to life there because you know so much of of japan looks similar let's say to to you know a city that you may have grown up in or something and so the expectation they had was 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 the same but then of course you know the longer you're there you realize the you know for example the levels of of formality and language are almost infinite Mm. and there's no way to really nothing is nothing is what it seems I, I had a friend who visited once and he was like gosh it's, isn't it like a bit like living in a movie where you sort of know that you're in it but you're, you're not really in it and I think <sighs> I think that was true but no I, I I had some I had some funny encounters there as well and um I I I loved I loved to just play with it I mean kids would point at me in the um, in the supermarket, we like sugoi takai nan, which means like, whoa, he's really tall, and <laughs> and and I would just like laugh and point back at them, and you know, try to say something stumbly in Japanese, and then they'd be like, oh, Joel's nan, like you're really fluent. Like, no, I'm not. <laughs> um, but I had I had so much fun there. I um, remember when we were walking around the first visit, me and Tora had obviously gone to a few places for some beer. You know, we're on holiday, it's allowed. <laughs> and we were a little bit tipsy and we were walking down um, uh, somewhere in Shibuya or somewhere like that. And I suddenly saw this really tall Japanese boy and he was gorgeous. <laughs> and uh, if my husband ever listens to this, he knows that I'm faithful. It's okay to now and again look around. <laughs> He was stunning. He must have been about six foot, yeah, five, something like that. And I mm. grabbed him and went, can I take your picture? And so there's this, I will send you the email afterwards with me and this sort of random, lovely, tall Japanese boy who was just so happy to have his picture taken with me. And I'm like, just going, <laughs> oh my goodness, you, the things we do. Did you flash the V like that? Oh no, but when we, um, when we were on our first day there, we were wandering around just, you know, in awe as you are with your camera and you're just, 
I mean, I get excited about the infrastructure, how they sort of do their roads and their kind of markings on the pavement and, um, you know, the the signs and the different, the, the way the shops are and what, what, does, what does that mean over there when there's this sort of low hanging sort of curtain above a door, you know, and trying to figure out this kind of new fascinating land you know um and we were wandering through and these um young japanese girls who are still in their school uniform just sort of came and took over and <laughs> one of them took my camera off me and then sort of did, just orchestrated a group shot so for that they all made us go like that um and, and stick you know do the peace sign so there's this really great picture of us with about you know, six random young girls who must be in their sort of, you know, must be going to university now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just fantastic. Just such a friendly, warm yeah. people. And and so much so, and polite as well. I remember I was wandering down this street and it was nothing special probably to the average local uh, Japanese person. Um, and it was just a back street, but it was fascinating. And I was taking pictures it was a thoroughfare, so people walked through it. And I suddenly became aware I was on my own and I was just taking mm. pictures of this empty alleyway. And I turned around slowly and there were about eight Japanese people all waiting patiently for me to take the shot. <laughs> and I just didn't know any Japanese. So I just went, no, no, it's okay. You can carry on. And they bowed to me and off they went. Uh-huh. And the minute I got back to Manchester after sleeping off jet lag and all the rest of it, I came out of my city centre flat onto the pavement, immediately got bumbled off of it onto the road by a group that had no idea I was there and were not even bothered. And I just sort of had a little moment. I was like, oh God, I wish I was back in Japan. Because it's just so different. Yeah, no, no, you're so right. And they're, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, you can, you could leave, if you, if you left your wallet, you know, at the, at the telephone booth, when they still had telephone booths, you could go back the next day and it would be there. Yeah. And if it wasn't there, it'd be at the nearest precinct and you could go get it. There's, there's, it's such a, yeah, it's such a wonderful culture. But before that, you were um, really into cycling. Were you, were you actually going to sort of pursue a career in, in road cycling? Is that something I read correct? Yes, that was the dream. I mean, oh. I, um, I left, uh, I had, I had two careers as a university student. I left, I left, um, actually I was almost done. Uh, I was studying history and international relations and I, I just, I, I just didn't want to be there anymore. And I, I went up, uh, to wash, I was in Virginia at the time and I, I moved to Washington DC and started working as a bicycle messenger mm. in the late eighties mm. and, um, got really involved in it and really competitive about it. And just still one of the it's always hard to say, but it's still one of the best jobs I've ever had. I mean, it was just fantastic, um, a fantastic life. And, um, you could do a lot with very little. And yeah, then I, I got, I got more competitive and then also wanted to race and, um, started, um, you know, training more seriously. And, um, uh, yeah, when I was in Japan, I was, I was racing there as well. Um, but yeah, nothing, nothing near the professional level. Although I did get to train with some, some professionals and, um, if I have that, gosh, that was ages ago too. Oh my God, no, I, <laughs> you need to get yourself a bike ready for when we come over and we'll go yeah. out for a group ride. Well, Sarah Boris as well it, is going to come over. Oh, that'd be brilliant. Well, it's, <laughs> you, you would love it. Minneapolis is, it, we're, we're always trading with Portland. We have, from my understanding, we have the most um, safe bike trails, et cetera, throughout mm. the city and beyond um, in the in the U.S. Oh, so, that's so nice. Yeah, and there's people here, myself not included. They they bike year round, so even if it's minus forty degrees centigrade, you'll see somebody out on their bike. It's cr- completely crazy. I love that though. That determination, that spirit, just to sort of, you know, I'm going to go out on my bike even though it's yeah. minus forty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's something special about Minneapolis, you know, and I'm not from here, but, and, but it really is, um, I, I, I really think that's the secret to, it's my pet theory anyway, but I think that's the secret to why there's such a great creative community here historically in music and the arts design. Um, and it's really because of winter because they can be so long and so extreme, you know, Prince has that song. Sometimes it snows in May, and he's not kidding. Um, <laughs> I should say had that song. Sorry, um, but um, 
if you if if you don't if you don't make things happen during that you know six to seven month period, it it won't happen. So I think that's what really is special about this place. People people really um, you know overcome that in their you, you know cabin fever existence. And yeah, of course during COVID, it's it's a bit it's a, it's a bit more challenging. But I think that's the same for everyone everywhere isn't it yeah, yeah definitely i think i think our um weather here is definitely a lot milder and so this mm. enforced lockdown or lockdowns of in recent sort of months have been quite challenging but i guess yeah. once you sort of accept the the kind of new normality you can really be quite creative um if you can think, find the energy <laughs> yeah i think that's true and i know I, there's been so much talk about that um ever since this began, you know, like there was that initial conversation about, well, okay, well, let's be productive every, anyway. And I think, yeah, I think most of us have found a way to, you know, on, on, on more than one occasion, just say, well, you know, I, there's nothing I can do. And you need, you need that time to, to regroup and, and, and gather your energies again too. So, yeah, I know that's been a struggle, especially to, for creative um, people everywhere. Hmm. Um, yeah, definitely. So um, you moved back to the States in 96. That sounds, feels like a long time ago. I'm trying to think. I think <laughs> I might have seen Pop Police itself in 96. <laughs> right. <Yeah, laughs> might have been the year before. <laughs> I, yeah, somewhere around there. The 90s were great for music. I, You know, I miss those days. Does that mean I'm old, Eric? Does that mean I've now officially... No, not at all. No, not at all. <laughs> and, um, you know, and well, I can... I can I can go back. I mean, the late seventies and eighties were great too. <laughs> so that that that. But um, yeah, no, no, no. Moving back there then um, was uh, yeah, that was kind of the turning point because actually I started working for a, a newspaper there in Virginia, and it was great. It was a great paper, um, but it, it's funny because that's right at the beginning um, in the, the magazine in Japan. We were we were actually working already um, across the internet, you know, th- through you know BBSs and and I had, for example, I had a Apple one forty five B, one of the first laptops, wow, with a with an eyeball trackpad and trackball, Ooh, I should say, snazzy. and uh, yeah, and a Tie Fighter startup sound that I put in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we and I had a 9600 k modem, and so I was the fastest man at the magazine, literally. And so we were working with designers in Toronto, for example, and we would download all night long. And Gosh. Um, and I came back to the states. I started working for this newspaper, and I remember there was this one meeting. Like they were all, they were still like sending files in in FedEx packages, the SyQuest drives, and you know, then jazz drives and zip drives and stuff like that. And I thought, gosh, you guys are so backwards. And this big, the, one of the big honchos from um, the paper was owned by this, this company in Chicago, like a lot of papers. And he came in and he gave a big talk to everybody. He said, you know, we're really not sure what to do with this, this internet thing. We think it's going to turn out to be another fad like CB radios. And I, I just laughed and said, well, I've got to get out of here. Um, because they clearly didn't understand what was coming. And, um, and then I was, I was years before when I, when I was studying philosophy, I took some art classes at my school. I went to William and Mary and, um, I had a really great art teacher and she took me aside one time. She said, you know, you, you should really think about studying graphic design. And like yourself at that Mm. point, I had no clue what that word or those two words even meant. And she said, if you're ever interested, I think you should go to this school VCU in Richmond. Um, and so I remembered that advice and I, I applied to a graduate program in visual communication. And luckily, I think I was the last person to be um, admitted that year. So uh, I got into this uh, MFA program and that was the, the best time of my life. Those two years were just, just really wonderful. We're taking a little break to get a word from our sponsor, Shillington, the original graphic design school, or in this case, some career advice from Jack Trotman, a designer and artist who's also a teacher at Shillington's campus in London. I asked Jack, what advice was shared to you that proved extremely helpful? Who was it and what did they say? Oh, let's think back. 
eight years ago, maybe seven years ago, I was waking up every morning at 5.30 to get a sort of two-hour bus to a job that I absolutely hated every single morning. It was a design job, um, but, you know, it was it was destroying me. Um, and I had absolutely no time for my friends or my family. Um, and it was actually my partner uh, who said to me, she, she just, you know, I think it was one evening when I, I got back home at like 10 o'clock and I was just, you know, eating some food and getting into bed and knowing that I had to wake up early the next day. She just said, um, what are your values? And does the place you work even share those values? And if they don't, why do you work there? And I honestly thought, yeah, what am I doing? You know, these people, they don't value the things that I value. They don't have the same morals that I have. So why, why should I work for them? And as soon as that happened, um, I pretty much left the job as quickly as I could and got a much more exciting design job somewhere else with much, much more lovely people. And um, yeah, like I said before, I think my, my mantra is definitely that uh, a good designer is a happy one. And so if you don't feel like you have those values being shared with the place that you're working um, or even a client that's offering you a job, I think that just don't do it. To find out more about studying graphic design at one of Shillington's six campuses around the world or via its online course, visit shillingtoneducation.com. Now, back to Eric. You know, I was kind of a bit sad for you when I was reading through your CV and seeing that you'd returned to the States in 96. I thought, gosh, how did he ever leave Japan? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny, you know, when you're in Japan, um, it's it's... You know, they, there's this conversation point where, you know, as welcoming as they are, and this is similar elsewhere, I think it's really much mm. the same here in Minnesota, they'll ask you things like, for example, but but you you must really miss bread. And and you say, no, I actually quite like the rice. And I've learned to, you know, I just love it here. And I, I, I want miso with my breakfast and rice. Oh, but no, you really must miss bread. Because <laughs> you're, and, and, and what they're really saying is, well, of course you miss your um where you're from. And, you know, I would say, well, I'm different. I'm very confused and not really from anywhere. <laughs> I'm sort of a foreigner everywhere. And, um, but I mean, coming, coming back then, and this was a, a sort of fate, I suppose, but my, when I, when I started at the program, one of the first people I met was, um, Ochisan Akira, who became my one of the greatest teachers of my life. And he was mm. Japanese and we became obviously fast friends. And, um, and, you know, I got to work with wonderful people like John Malinowski, who was the heart at the head of the program. The three of us were just really tight. And um, mm. so in a bizarre way, I got to, um, I got to keep that connection to Japan, obviously, obviously through Ochi-san, but I, I have to say, it's really, it's really funny thinking back on that now. He and I were this very strange couple because we, we used to, he's, he used to love to go fishing and, and Richmond in Virginia has the James coming right through the city. Mm. And you can be in the middle of the river and you, you, you feel like you're in the middle of nowhere because the, the embankments are all filled with trees and you can't see anything but nature. And it's just really beautiful. Um, mm. and there's some great, great fishing there. And he, I, he taught me more about graphic design through fishing than um, than any than anything else. I mean, wow. I, that's no disrespect to any of the you know um, great works that I read or studied, you know. And um, but yeah, he was he was such a character, uh, and we made we made quite the pair. You know, I was this really tall, skinny guy, and you know, he's rather short, and we're sort of hopping around the rocks, avoiding snakes and. And beavers and and large catfish, um, but you know he had two two strategies, and one strategy was passive, and the other was active. So passive fishing and active fishing. So pa passive fishing, we'd go very early in the morning. Um, passive fishing was just a, you know we we would use minnows, and and a float, and he would say, okay, Eric, let's just let's let's be passive and we'll we'll throw these out and we'll let the minnow do the work for us <laughs> and we will drink our beer I and so like we would that. do that <laughs> that was very very good and then active was more like okay eric now i see this fish and i'm going to catch this fish and so you know the strategy of 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 allowing a um another you know creature to become interested in what 
you had, right, you know, and the, the strategy of where to place the bait and how to, to present it, as they say, well, was really fascinating to me. And it's really just like, um, you know, graphic design in, in a sense, you know, I, I talk about that with students a lot, you know, I mean, even if it's a, if it's a book spine in a crowded library or a, or a bookshop, each of those spines are, are, are trying to compete for attention in a, in a different way. And it's largely, obviously, through color to some extent. Um, and I think that's a great place to study, you know, graphic strategy in that way too. But it, it might also be, you know, if you're in a city and you're on a bus or on a walk like you were describing earlier where something catches your attention out of the corner of your eye. To me, that's the, that's really the heart of, of, of visual communication. You know, that, that initial uh, question mark that you can hopefully, you know, inspire in someone and then, um, you know, ask them to come closer. And, and, and that's how I, I, I sometimes, uh, you know, describe how to, how to develop, ideas around hierarchy is, is thinking about that person that you're trying to bring in closer to whatever object it is um, that you've, you've designed. And so, yeah, that all goes back to fishing with, <laughs> with, with my teacher, what's son on the James. That's amazing. <laughs> and ho- hooking people in with visual communications. I love it. <laughs> and, and you are now in education and have been for some time and teaching other people about graphic design and, um, it sounds like you've found your calling. You're really enjoying that um, because you, this is your sort of main focus now, isn't it? Teaching, teaching other people how to how to communicate with with visual it, language. It, yeah, no, absolutely. Well, I mean, it, it's my, my father was a teacher, and so, and very early age, um, I started teaching. Even when I was in high school, I was I was a lifeguard. I, I was in Egypt at that point in Cairo, actually, um, and uh, I always knew that I wanted to be a teacher because I just always, you know, and I I coached, um, you know, young, um, you know, you like the world that correctly says football, but of course here they say soccer, <laughs> soccer, um, soccer, <laughs> um, and so I knew I always wanted to teach and. Um, as I re- always, you know, l- looked up to my father's career and he, he went on to administration mm-hmm. and I've kind of done that too, you know, having been chair now for a bit, but, um, no, I always knew I wanted to teach. And when, you know, when I finally, when I finally finished the MFA program, I was shopping my, my portfolio around and, and I had some really, uh, really great interviews and I had some opportunities. Um, but in the end, um, I, I, I found my first teaching position in Philadelphia and, uh, yeah, I haven't looked back since I, I just, I absolutely love it. I, now I only, I only teach one class a semester now as chair. And, um, yeah, I was just reminding my students on Friday that, you know, and I, I do enjoy the other things that I do as chair, but you know, there's no question Friday is the best day when I get to teach and be with them. So Oh, that's lovely. And have you seen anything change amongst your kind of pupils over the years? Have, have there been sort of different things that have come into play? I mean, obviously with technology changing, that's a huge thing. But Oh, absolutely. Yeah, well, that's, you know, that's the challenge of our, of our time right now is the, um, and it's an opportunity too, but it's, you know, it's fair to say, um, so, for example, when I first started teaching, you know, I, I remember some student evaluations that I got, and I was, um, I was pretty, you know, I was pretty hardcore. I think it's fair to say, and I really pushed students and tried to get the best out of them. And I really, I loved every minute of it. But a friend of mine, we're friends now. He was a student at the time. I remember guessing at who it might have been that said this, and later confirmed it. But he said taking a class from Eric Brandt is like studying graphic design with a football hooligan. <laughs> and um, because I had my hair really short back then, I was studying Taekwondo and stuff like that. Oh, wow. Okay. B- bringing up all these, you know, like, okay, it's just like martial arts. and It's a new way of thinking of form and blah, blah. Um, but that, you know, th- you know, I think, you know, um, I think for the better students have really, it, it's, it's not now it's, I think the challenge for us is not so much, um, you know, the, the, 
ever increasing speed of of development of technology or all these wonderful toys that we that we can play with the challenge is this generation that we're that we're seeing now in the last 4 or 5 years they're really um they're coming out of this literally like a new age of where they've been exposed from a very early stage in their lives to social media and all mm. its trials and tribulations and they're coming with um i think much bigger questions about life they're 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 keenly aware that um their future has been compromised both in terms of um you know the climate um the, the you know the obvious challenges that the you know global economy faces they know they know these things and so they're a little they're not i would say you know you know we don't see students you know so called let's say alpha students anymore that are competing with each other and really pushing each other and trying to be at the top they're mm-hmm. much more interested in being together and being supportive of each other and being a part of something That's so yeah it, there's, there's a lot of talk here now about um you know these terms that we're hearing now of cultural leadership and things like that and it's it's all fine and good but i find that these students I, I you know for example i had a conversation some years ago with a very you know high level ceo at a at a really you know big fortune 500 company and and he was saying well you know i'm i'm interested in finding the next generation of 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 leaders in in graphic design and and i i just said to him you know these students aren't interested in leadership. They want to be a part of something, you know. They they might get to that stage, and I know they will. But they are they're they're much more um, community minded. They're much more supportive of each other. And I think, you know, for example, that's my secret hope that even in this post, um, uh, I, I can't even say his name. You know, here in the states we say forty five if we don't want to say the obvious. We'll back. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Post that, and now this, you know, the, the, that party is trying to still imagine itself in his name, etc. I think, I think this so-called Gen Z, I think they're going to save us because they're not interested in any of that a language of 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 hatred and um, and white supremacy, etc. They're they're much more interested in the larger community and supporting each other, and they just have absolutely no trouble like people in my generation have with what's all this talk about pronouns and you know what I mean. Like they're just completely fluent in a world that will be. Um, much better, I think. So, but yeah, teaching this generation is really different. There's, I think, a lot of my colleagues. Um, I suppose it depends on where you are, you know, and and and, and the and the the group dynamics that come in. Um, but I I I still find it. I mean, that's it's it's still a it's still a you know teaching is is invigorating because it is constantly evolving and changing mm. and because you're always being exposed to to new people um and you know once you become a so-called um, as it was called anyway and in, in a long time ago sort of a filing cabinet teacher where you're oh it's week 5 well here we go i've got week 5 right here and and mm. and and if you if you expect to walk into a room and that you know 20 years later that that assignment still fits then you you probably shouldn't be teaching because um it's always a matter of 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 reacting to and learning from and learning with um you know these new minds that are um you know searching for something that's so fascinating it must be fascinating for you given that you once studied philosophy and it's trying to figure out where that kind of comes from and and why they these young minds are behaving in that way i myself find it fascinating and uh, yeah. my generation um the the uh, i think i'm a zenial I'm in a sort of very, you know, which I quite like, you know, right, right. it strokes my ego greatly. I'm in a very kind of small window of four years where um, I like taking risks and I played out in the countryside and my parents let me go off and play for hours and hours. I mean, my mum would give me a backpack with some sandwiches and say, don't come back until it's dark. And they would, they didn't know where we were and we had no mobile phones. So she couldn't keep an eye on, on tracking me or anything like that. So we were very free and wild and um that kind of so great yeah and and i really really appreciate that because i i can see how that shaped me as a person and i can see how other people from my age group have had similar kind of experiences and have ended up doing you know all sorts of different things but a lot of it involving risk and 
um, building businesses. Mm. Um, it's quite it's, it's quite fascinating, and I think I, I feel really lucky that um, I I grew up with that. But then you're right; the younger people that are coming up now in, in Generation Z, there is this sense of community. I've noticed that as well. There's a kind of sense of collaboration, and they mm. are curious. Mm. I wasn't really curious about the world when I was their age i was mm. just interested in going out and partying and um <laughs> doing things i probably shouldn't have done um but these these young minds they're sort of so um aware of world issues and politics and, it, mm-hmm. and they're so engaged and it's mm-hmm. it's fascinating it, it really is and it well and it's been forced on them and you know mm. it's it's you know people we've when we first started identifying the shift, you know, around, I would say around seven years ago. And, you know, particularly here in the United States, it, it's, you know, it, because it's such a, uh, in, in some ways, such an awful place. I mean, so for example, I have a, I have two young girls, one is five and one is 10. And my 10 year old is now in fifth grade. And, you know, she was first exposed to the need for uh, training for a, a, sh- a shooter in the school in second grade. And I remember her telling me about, well, and then we learned to go into the bathroom and sit on top of the um, commode so that you couldn't see your feet. And I just struck me like, oh my God, these Gosh. people, these people have been living with this thinking and surely it has some negative side effects. Um, but I think that's why, I think that's why they're kind of clear eyed and and they're in no rush. You know what I mean? They're like, well, yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, and I'm not a boomer, but you know, that term has now gone, I think a little more broadly, but do, do, <laughs> from my, you know, okay, boomer. I've um, taken ownership of that with creative <laughs> boom. I call pe- uh, people oh, who nice. like follow us. Hey, <laughs> hey, boomers. I just take, take the mic and I don't, nobody's oh, ever good. said anything yet, but I hope they realize the humor there. But anyway, oh, that's so good. That's so good. I love that. <laughs> no, it's so funny. No, because they're just like, you know, you know, I, I'm going to take my time at this, and um, uh, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not, I, I don't feel that pressure to, you know, go to university right away and then land my first job and and things like that. Um, I, I'm, I mean, I know that's uh, different with, and I'm not an authority on this. I mean, these are just no, my no. sort of observations, but sure. it it does it does strike me, you know, that there, um, you know, I, of course. It, you know, personally, I really worry about, you know, my, my two girls growing up in this, in this world that's so uncertain now. And, um, but yeah, I, I know for a fact that those things have, uh, marked this generation. And, and, but I think that's why, you know, they, they were a big part of this, um, defeat of this, you know, abject evil we had to suffer through these last five years. And I think they'll be a big part of the future too. I'm really, that's my hope anyway. I'm, um, because we're not out of this yet here, unfortunately. Oh no, the world is still changing. Um, well, speaking of your daughters, I love that they're also a highlight on your CV, which is a beautiful long list of not just (laughs) sort of career highlights, but highlights from your life. For instance, I love that you mentioned the purchase of a 1977 Ford LTD in 2002. I'm not into cars. So is this a special thing? (laughs) Well, it's fun. It is a special thing because at that time I was going through, I was going through a really, really hard time in my life. I had just moved out to um, the middle of Pennsylvania. I was teaching at Penn State University. I was facing some financial difficulties. And um, the, I, when I when I was emerging from that finally, um, and I could afford to buy a car, I found this 1977 Ford LTD for $750. Um, and it's an absolute dream car because it's just one of these aberrations, right? Like American aberrations. It's, like it's absolutely horrible, but it's, you know, like five meters long, made of, you know, Pennsylvania steel. And it's made for the highway, the, 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 the shock of, you know, it's just this really long, comfortable couch. Um, <laughs> and I was so proud of that thing. It was we, we, because it, it was part of, you know, this, um, you know, coming out of this difficult time in my life. And, mm. and it was just it, funny, you know, you could, you could, you could drive as big as it was, you could drive it with your fingertip, you know, because the, the, uh, the steering was so well balanced and, uh, 
Yeah, it's just a great car. <laughs> Isn't it amazing these little things that we do, these things we purchase, they they mark pivotal moments in our lives that we remember. And and for you, the following year, you launched Typographica. Um, so it, it kind of sounds like it was a, a turning point for you. Yeah, it was. Well, in, in the years before that, it's kind of a funny aside, but um, before I started calling Studio Typographica, I, it, my old studio name was U16 Erk, which was a conglomerate of, of different letter forms from different languages. So, uh, so some German and a K from my name and stuff like that. And it was great fun to say, um, but it was really hard to get people to, to write checks or, or, you know, like make, I mean, it sounds silly and it was silly, but I was really fascinated by that idea at the time um, of, um, this is kind of an old fashioned idea about graphic design and the designer, but I, I really like the idea of anonymity um, and, um, you know, the idea of a designer as a servant, not necessarily a personality. And Typographica kind of kept that as well, because I actually, at the time, I found that a reference to, to um, um, Czech um, typographic unions, and that was where that word came from. Um, but it's odd, because years later, um, the, uh, Crack Magazine in the UK was asking me, like, why do you, why do you use a pseudonym? And I thought, oh gosh, I'd never thought about it that way. I, it's not a pseudonym; it's just a name and stuff like that. But then I was really fascinated by that idea. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's yeah. I saw that. I, I actually saw the short film of the same name of, the, of what you called your studio before. I'm, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce it, um, but I saw a short film on YouTube before this chat. Was it ever the same name? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Which one did you watch? Oh, um, I can't remember what it was called. It was something and something. Um, oh, the, well, was... there's a couple there. Yeah. That's kind of funny. I You're made... in a funny hat, basically. Yes. The rabbit. Yeah. No, that's actually, yeah, that's a character. And I made, I started in graduate school. I started making these silly film <laughs> films with a friend, um, John, um, and, uh, we developed these, you know, these just silly films. We were just experimenting, you know, they had, they had like, I said, what was it at the time? You know, it was like early versions of uh, Adobe. Um, gosh, I can't even remember what it was called back then. Um, but anyway, that continued and on my own. And when I, yeah, when I was out there in, in central PA, I started making these um, short videos. So the one Ulaanbaatar. That's it. Yeah, and then kind of clone and clone, clone column, <laughs> and then that was with my students. And then Urbi, Urbi at Orbi. That's that's the one where I tried to explain the meaning of life. <laughs> <laughs> and I love fair, that. fair warning, you can. Well, it was it was a it was right after nine eleven, mm. and after this very difficult uh, time in my life. And I was trying to just put, put some of those pieces together. So that, that character and then another character take, take a role in there. <laughs> where, did you, where did you get this lovely bonkers sense of humor from? Did I read somewhere, right, that it was a grandmother in, in Germany or something? Or am I completely making that up? Oh, no. My, my grandmother... Um, both of my grandmothers were, were wonderful people, but... Um, my Omi um, was a really interesting, she was completely, you know, self-educated. She was born like my father on the, uh, uh, off the coast of Northern Germany, an island called Nordstrand. And um, she, by the end of her life, she was an avid reader. And I know for sure that she had read almost every book in the library in their little village, Bachvato. So she was incredibly um well educated, but she had yeah no she had a, a a really good you know as as Germans are want you know dry sense of humor you know very <laughs> straightforward and and my, my father is very much the same way you know you get a good laugh out of just a simple oh this is like that type situation but yeah no she <laughs> she famously when I I came to visit once and I was proudly showing uh, I I you know I I was finished with university and um. And yeah, she she famously said, and you know, it, you know, well, that's great, but now begins the seriousness of life. <laughs> <laughs> Jetzt beginnt das Ernst des Lebens. You know, don't enjoy, <laughs> don't enjoy, enjoy it too much, boy. Now it's time to get to work. Yeah, um, but yeah, no, she was she was really great. 
Oh, yeah, all these lovely people that we just fondly remember and uh, and you sort of highlight on this wonderful CV. Um, <laughs> it's great. I, I'm just going through it. And obviously we can talk about your work, your projects that you've done and the latest being the politi- uh, Politica, Politica mm-hmm. um, and all these beautiful kind of artworks and there's just so much richness i mean do you want to talk about that as well or yeah sure well thank you for saying so i I really appreciate that it's because it's been well like for everyone i think it's it's so it's obviously so lonely but a lot of these you know things like some of the paintings you see behind me have have Mm -hmm. emerged from um when when i was running Ficciones Typographica, which was the the poster project outside my my garage, um, my own contributions tended to be political in nature because I had you know and I I I had this I had this uh, stage right and I always felt sort of obligated in my own way to to use it and to 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 make commentary from time to time and so that developed into Typographica Politica, um, which is you know th- then reached such a a point of abject despair because there, you know, as you experienced too, in, in these last five years, there were just absolutely unimaginable things happening every five minutes. And there was no way that you could come up with a, a, a commentary in a sense. And so in a way I, um, I started backing away from that and started focusing on these, um, what I'm calling my, my three friends or these really sort of brutalist, um, reduced forms that in some cases come from these, you know, flattened packaging that then I try to, to, to give language to with a small sentence about the, you know, these three friends. Um, and so in a way they're still really political. They've, they've, there's always, I think a commentary there. Um, but it's helped me kind of, um, I think in my own way, and this is something that my teachers, you know, Akira and John Malinowski really um, gifted me with, you know, many, many years ago. It's just a, it's, it's not just, it's not a retreat to pure form, um, but it's, it's a, it's a, it's a reorientation and a, and a, and a, um, a cementing, I should say, or, or would like to say, you know, that I'm, so what I'm trying to do now is really just re-inspire myself by the things that I would do, um, you know, as a child, when I finally came to understand that graphic design meant something. And when I, when I was, when I had those two years as a graduate student to really invest in work and making work and invariably making it by hand. And so to me, this is also really an important part of this is to, um, um, you know, in this, in this time that we have with, um, you know, living in lockdown and, and living lockdown like, even if it, you know, if it's, if it's not there anymore with, with omnipresent death <laughs> all around us, um, it's <sighs> been, it's been really, it's been really important. And I won't make any boast that I'm, you know, down here on a daily basis. There's, there's been weeks sometimes where I'm just not able to make anything. Um, but when I do find, um, that, uh, you know, it's very common, right? That spark. And, um, I'm able to, you know, t- the limitations that I've, I've I'd really enjoyed are using the colors that I had available. I haven't bought anything. <laughs> so <laughs> a lot of the colors that you see in some of the work has just come from when I, I, I repainted my, my house with all these really bright colors. Cause I wanted to, um, you know, brighten it up for my girls during the long gray winter months. <laughs> so that's been, it's been really fun working with that. And what I, what I love most about these paintings, especially the really brutal black, um, forms. And it's a shame that no one, they really need you to be closer. It's, it's very similar to what I was talking about before with, with the idea of fishing and the, the, the textures that I'm able to create or have tried to create, um, really need to be seen in, in person. So in a bizarre way, no one has really seen these. Um, and it's not bizarre at all. You can't see them. <laughs> there's no way. <laughs> there's, there's no safe place to do that, but not yeah. yet. It's coming. Yes. It's yes. coming. Better yes. days are, are nearly here. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> no, you're so right. And you're so right. So what will you take with you? Um, as we move to that kind of better time, um, what have you kind of been reminded of in the last kind of 12 months? I think, I think, you know, it's, I, I imagine, 
I, I imagine it's the same for all of us. I mean, you just, you just, you're just so aware now what it means to really be human. Um, and so, for example, what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of people, and we've all, uh, you know, educators, uh, laborers, all kinds of people have managed to find a way, if, if you're fortunate, you know, and I have to say, I'm incredibly fortunate to have a job that's allowed me to work remotely. As you know, many, many people have not had that luxury. But um, I, I know the conversation has been around, especially in, in education fields, you know, well, we can do this and we can, and, and we can actually flourish to some degree. Um, and maybe it's, uh, 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 maybe it's my age, maybe I'm old fashioned, but I mean, I just, I can't imagine a future um, that's dependent on being separate from each other like this. Mm. And so, you know, I mean, be, being human means being with other humans, period. There's nothing, you know, uh, ground shaking about that, but the, the lack of, 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 of touch, of, 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 you know, sharing a, a chance conversation, uh, you know, he, overhearing other people's conversation, you know, as you're walking through the world, you know, those things are, um, are, you just can't measure them. Right. So I, I think I'm going to take a great, I mean, I really, I, I you know, as a designer, I've always said, I, I mean, I really, you know, you know, some, some people sort of look down on, and, and you know, as, as experts, you know, like, Oh, I hate clients. Oh, clients are the worst or people don't understand me. And that's, that's all fine and good. Um, but I really believe in, in the, you know, the, the intelligence of people and the, their, their, their need to ask questions and to, and to understand each other. And that's, uh, that's always been a part of my work. And I, I really think that's, yeah, going forward, my gosh, I just, I want to, um, I want to be with people so badly. It's awful. I mean, I mean, and I, I, I mean, it's kind of funny. I, I, I really, I worry a little bit because I have a feeling that there's going to be, you know, a year from now when people can finally be together, you know, there's going to be a redefinition of, of how we interact with each other socially. You know, I, mm. I, I wonder, I wonder about that. Will we, will be able to embrace each other, you know, as, as friends or, or, or will there be this sort of lagging suspicion of, you know what I'm saying? Right. Like, so yeah. I, I imagine, I imagine a lot of inappropriate hugging too, because people will just be so desperate yes. to, to express their, and it will, it will, it will cross the line really quickly into, well, was that, was that, was that good or bad? And, you know, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. That I know what you mean. It's kind of like that determination to become together and hug each other, but also for everything we've learned in the last five, 10 years, you know, the mm. world's changed. I mean, I used to yes. call myself a hugger and now I'm reluctant to call myself one because yeah. not everybody yeah. appreciates a hug. Yeah. Um, and, and that's good because I'm now more aware of, of other people's kind of, you know, sensitivities and, and that's great. But um, yeah, you're right. It'll, it'll just, I think it's just going to be a mad roaring 19, you know, 2020, <laughs> like in roaring twenties. And um, I think what we should that's do, great- Eric, I think we should buy some children children's t-shirts in bright pink i think we should get the populate itself album and yes um fill in absolutely forked. <laughs> and we're gonna base i'm gonna come over to where you are and we're gonna rave it up oh that sounds brilliant with yes, sarah please. boris we'll get in touch with radiohead we'll we'll see what oh, beastie that'll... boys are up to <laughs> that'll be great <laughs> my my two girls would absolutely love that they're 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 becoming well, my mother, as the, you know, the expression goes, taught me to speak that way, and they've definitely overheard a few choice expressions from me. <laughs> and my youngest is now um, exploring those uh, those ranges as well, to my shock sometimes. But then, yeah, I'm sure it was the same for my mother. I remember she's asking my brother and I, "Where did you learn to talk that way?" We're like, "What the." <laughs> well, from you, mom, <laughs> and we love her for it. There's no question about that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much for your time, Eric. Um, oh, thank you. The hour has flown by. It's just been such a pleasure. And I know we could sit here for another hour, but um, maybe we'll save that for a, for a refreshing cold beer somewhere someday. Oh, please, please. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Creative Boom podcast with your host, Katie Cowan. 
Thanks to our sponsor, Shillington, the original graphic design bootcamp that has helped students achieve award-winning portfolios and land incredible jobs in as little as three months. To find out more, go to shillingtoneducation.com. To listen or subscribe to the Creative Boom podcast, visit creativeboom.com forward slash podcast. And if you're enjoying the show, please let us know on any of our socials or by leaving us a review. Join me next time when my guest will be the actress, writer, filmmaker and creative coach, Abiola Ogunbiyi.